Okay, in the last uh, meeting, I guess we looked at uh, how to solve a system of nonlinear algebraic equations, uh, which could come from any dynamical system. Even if you have a partial differential equation, you can discretize the spatial variable. And if it is dynamic, I mean, if it is dynamic, you'll get an ordinary differential equation. If it is a steady state, you will get an algebraic equation like this. And our task was basically to develop algorithms that will allow us to construct x as a function of p that satisfies that equation. So that is what we call a solution path or a bifurcation diagram. And it could be very complicated like this. And you could have branches coming on from that. And I'll give, uh, give you some uh, real life examples from fluid mechanics and uh, from reaction engineering as well. But let's just continue with uh, the idea of uh, what happens when you get around such critical points uh, to the basic idea of a simple parametric continuation and how do you overcome that with an arcuate continuation. So we saw in a simple uh, parametric continuation that we take the derivative, the slope of that function which is dx dp okay and uh, that is obtained by taking the derivative of this equation with respect to p what happened to that equation <laughs> okay so that's basically minus j inverse uh, df dp that is a simple continuation. Uh, it's called Euler-Newton continuation. <clears throat> and here we get a good initial guess. We are going to always use New Newton method on that system to get a converged result that gives us the solution on this curve. But and as an initial condition, we get x at p plus delta p as equal to x at p plus this dx dp that is uh, basically Taylor series delta p first order plantation of Taylor series. So it is this vector dx dp that we get from this equation and we saw computationally it's an extremely efficient process because we have already constructed the Jacobian and inverted that in solving the first equation by the Newton method. So the Jacobian contains lot of information about the slope as well as about the stability. Okay. Now in the Arkland, we said that this will fail when the solution turns around, like if you are near a turning point and then you are projecting like this with the vector dx dp with delta p taking you away from the limit point, then this is not a good initial guess and uh, to the solution in this particular example that lies here. Now you might have a situation where the solution just turns around and never comes back. Okay, then there is no solution beyond that particular value of the parameter. Then the Newton method will try whatever number of iterations you give and then it will fail. So how do we overcome that? And we saw that we can re-parameterize the problem. So the problem, this is called the arc length continuation. And the basic idea is we treat f of x as a function of s p as a function of s equal to 0. s is the measure of a new parameter we introduce in the problem which measures the arc length, how far away we are. And then we, so we gain an extra degree of freedom by introducing an extra parameter and we treat p as an unknown. Previously p was specified and we were trying to obtain a solution for x at the particular value of p. Now p is treated as an unknown and uh, so we add an additional equation which we call the arc length equation as p of s and s itself. And so what we have is we have n plus 1 equations in n plus 1 unknowns. And the unknowns are x and p and they are both functions of s. And there are many ways you can construct this extended uh, additional equation. Okay which is a measure of the arc length. And one of the ways that we wrote down was x 
minus x naught squared and you typically put a weighting factor and I will tell you why p minus p naught squared uh, plus uh, s minus s naught squared equal to 0. That is if, if w1 and w2 were for example 1 that would represent the equation for a circle or a sphere or a hypersphere depending on the dimension of the system. So and x naught p naught would be the current reference point so it would be the center of the sphere. Okay? So if you go back to this figure if I am around here I take that as the center and I draw a circle of radius s minus s naught. Okay, and then ask the question go and find me a solution where this equation is satisfied that means it is on the circle plus that equation is satisfied which means on the on that curve. So there are two such solutions the intersection of these two and next we have to worry about which way the continuation method will go. Okay, So here this is an unknown this is an unknown w1 and w2 are weighting parameters that we typically use because in some cases for example if you have a reaction problem where you have concentration and temperature the concentration may be going between 0 and 1 temperature may be going between 0 and 300 okay so one of the variables may be poorly scaled so what it means is that it's you don't you no longer have a hypersphere but you have a hyper ellipse if you like okay it stretches the coordinates so you may want to bring them back into a spherical shape so basically for scaling purposes you use this uh, as an extra degree of freedom but these are constants you tune them as you need okay. Uh, <clears throat> I, I will put an example of a MATLAB code for the 2 by 2 example from reaction engineering because some of you asked for specific examples and maybe we can work through it or you can work through it. I will put the MATLAB code so you can understand how, how to implement all these things. Now what we do we have for reformulated our problem with an n plus 1 equation and n plus 1 unknowns. Okay. So this problem now has a well posed solution meaning we do not have any more uh, trying to find the solution here. We are trying to find a solution from this reference point at a distance s minus s now. Okay. So that solution is well posed and there are proofs, theorems that show that this is uh, not a singular system anymore and you will get a solution. But how do we solve that system? We treat that once again as a nonlinear system of algebraic equations. So we apply Newton method on that. Okay. So the extended system would now be, let me call that capital X, is going to consist of X comma P. X is a vector of n length and P is there. Okay. So my Newton method will be something like X Q plus 1 equals X Q minus J inverse. Uh, let me call it as capital F. Okay, that's essentially Newton method on this set of functions f, which consists of f and n. So I've just extended the system. Okay, I now formulated n plus one by n plus one equation, and this is uh, n plus one by n plus one. Now, what is J here? What I mean, the script, whatever the symbol is, what is that? That is the Jacobian of this function. So, this would be df with respect to d capital X. Right? So, you can actually, in using uh, block matrices, if you want, you can write it as something like this. So, in this block, you will have the original Jacobian which are all the partial derivatives of f with respect to n. So j is df with respect to dx. That is an n by n system. Okay. So here I will have a column vector. What would that be? Can you visualize in your mind what we are trying to do? We are trying to solve and n plus 1 by n plus 1 equation. So by Newton method. Okay. So this vector is n plus 1 consists of x and p. Okay. And this is a derivative of these functions n plus 1 functions. So what I am saying is I can take the derivative of the first n functions with respect to the first n variable that will give me this. And in the next column I should have the derivative of the first n 
functions with respect to with respect to p, right? So it would be df dp. Now, is that an additional word? No, because we have already calculated that also. Where did we calculate that? We calculated that in here. Okay, we have calculated already j. We have calculated df dp. Okay, so what will go in this row? All the derivatives of n with respect to x. N is a scalar, single equation. But x is a vector. Okay, so here you will have dn dx. And the last one would be dn with respect to dp. So it is only this last row that you need to take the derivative, additional derivatives, to construct your super Jacobian. Okay, the n plus 1 by n plus 1 Jacobian. The idea is what is important. I want you to know how to extend this. Once we get this idea, we will use the same ideas for tracking other singular points also. And there are papers that tell you what are the exactly uh, extended systems that we need to calculate a limit point or a half bifurcation point or other types of uh, uh, bifurcation points. Did I start recording? I guess I forgot. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Okay. So now you use the Newton method, but you specify in that entire system, the extended system, S will be your parameter. So you specify S. Keep changing delta s if you like. That's a radius. Okay, and uh, if you follow this, I'm going to ask you the next question. Okay, I, we we post this problem that there are two solutions. Okay, there are two solutions from this reference point. One is here and one is there. How do I decide which one I can go to? That would depend on the initial condition that we give. If we give an initial condition close enough to one of them then that will be attracted to that particular solution, right? So this is where this idea of a region of attraction of each steady state solution is useful to have because if you are close enough to that steady state uh, within the region of attraction, then the initial condition will go to that particular solution. So can you think of a way of getting the solution on the front side and not on the back side? Or the back side and not on the front, front side? How would you do that? How would you generate a good initial gas from this particular point. So, so uh, you are you're on the right track, but I want to make sure that the idea is right. sharper. <laughs> You need you need to project the initial gas vector, right. and what you are saying is from here. What we have right now is we have somehow come up up to this point where our Euler-Newton method fails. Right. Okay, so we simply apply the Newton and the Euler-Newton, starting at a very low parameter value when the problem was linear, nice, and we started coming up to here, and in going from to the next step, it keeps failing. One of the things that you can do is you can just half the step size and half the step size and then you will hit as close to the limit point as possible but you will not be able to go beyond. Okay. So we said now I am going to reformulate once I hit that stage I am going to reformulate the problem like this. So at this stage all I have is a convert solution as close to the limit point as possible. Right. So what else can I do to get, should I give that as the initial gas? You can. And it will converge, but you will have no control over which one it converges to because both of them are likely to be this as good a guess because we are at the same distance roughly from this uh, two solutions, right? So you can use the idea of projection of that vector, but you cannot use the projection with respect to dx dp because our problem now has s as the independent parameter, right? So what you need to do is apply the same Euler Newton on the extended system. That means you are going to calculate the vector dx, d capital X, ds. Okay. So Euler Newton on extended system. Uh, will give the tangent vector. OK. 
Okay, and that would simply mean I need to calculate D capital X with respect to DS, not DP but DS. Okay, so what would that be? Minus the new extended Jacobian, right, multiplied by I want you to be kind of able to complete this. I start the thought process, but what would that be? What would I write there? Remember, symbolically, what I have done is I have these two equations, I am writing this as f of chi s equal to 0, right. So, I have the n plus 1 equations, but symbolically, I am writing them as capital F. Capital F is packed with the lowercase f and n. n is an equation, new equation, okay. And capital X is packed with the vector x and p, okay. And s is a new parameter. So, this problem at this stage looks the same as the one that we had here, right, except right, everything became capital with the meaning <coughs> more suitably modified. Capital F is small f plus n, capital X is small x plus p, and p is the new parameter s, okay. So, when we had this, this is the Euler-Newton continuation, which was obtained by simply taking the derivative of df with respect to dp, I am setting that equal to 0, right. This is what we saw in the last class. So, that is exactly what we are going to do now to this equation. And when you do that, you will get the dx ds is equal to the minus of the big Jacobian multiplied by df ds. Thank you. <laughs> that is it. Now, what is df ds? It is going to be 0 for df ds would be a vector, right? df ds would be a vector and that vector will contain all of zeros, the first n zeros. Why? Because the first function does not have s in it at all, right? It is only the last equation that you need to calculate. So, it is going to be dn ds. So, that again a very simple vector to calculate, even if you have 100,000 equations, because it is only the last equation that is going to have that, okay? Now, you get a tangent vector, okay. So, that now your next guess is going to be equal to the current value plus or minus. That is what will decide. We're going for, the tangent vector is the same. We are going to go forward or going to go backward, okay. And dx, ds times delta s. So, with that you can control whether you are going uh, in the forward direction and give an initial guess, we are going in the backward direction to the initial guess. Remember, if I plot this graph in terms of the new parameter s, how should that graph look like? Here I have plotted the solution in terms of p. So, in terms of p, it has these turning points and it turns around, but s is a distance measured along the curve, right? So, the, cu the curve would be kind of stretched out. For every s, there will be only basically one solution, okay. That is what makes the problem go away, right. <coughs> it does not make the problem of branching go away. So, if you have a branch like this, what does the arc length do? You are somewhere be be before here and you calculate your tangent vector and you can give initial guess there, right. So, if you are using arc length, you will not even know that there is a branch. You just follow the tangent vector, okay. So, if there is a branch to that, there are other ways that you need to monitor to say, okay, there is likely a branch and I need to take a vector that is perpendicular to this. Instead of take that vector, take a vector perpendicular to that, give an initial guess there. So, there are algorithms for switching, branch switching. Okay, but you need to be able to monitor certain quantities along the curve. 
to see that there is likely to be a branch. Otherwise, if you apply the arc length as we have discussed, it will just go and give you one curve. Okay, if there is a branching curve, you will not be able to detect that. As you are carrying this, of course, what you can do, one of the simple monitoring things would be often the stability changes at those critical points. So you have the Jacobian, we have the basic Jacobian, right? You can always calculate the eigenvalues of the basic Jacobian to see whether there are any sign changes. That would be an indication that stability is changing. Okay, that would be an indication something happens between those two steps. Okay, so that's a very powerful idea of how to extend the system to overcome a problem that we face. Okay, in terms of a turning point, and this idea has been applied to a number of singular points. I'll give you a paper and kind of take you through uh, what are the other types. But let's just see this idea one more time. Now focusing on what we want to do is locate exactly where the turning point is. What is the value of the critical value of the T where the point, the solution turns. Okay. So we have already learned that it is, if it is a simple limit point, what happens to the eigenvalues? One of them goes to zero. Exactly one eigenvalue goes to zero from the negative plane to the positive plane. So if you have a high dimensional system, a simple point in fact is defined in such a way that there is only one eigenvalue. If there are two eigenvalues that are going to zero, then you have a higher order singularity and higher conditions that must be imposed. And so mathematicians have kind of classified various types of singularities and imposed methods for that. But the simplest one that we have seen is if it is a simple limit point, there must be exactly one eigenvalue that goes to zero. So the question is how can I impose that condition and make Tc the critical point as the unknown and then track that critical point, solve for the critical point. Arc length allows us to jump over it. Okay. Arc length does not tell us exactly where it is. It allows us to jump over it. That is, if you are interested in finding where it is, then we need to impose an additional condition. But the idea is the same. We are going to impose on the original system f of x p equal to 0 on this system. We are going to impose an additional condition that not only this equation must be satisfied, but the condition of one eigenvalue equal to 0 must be satisfied. If you remember, what is an eigenvalue? The eigenvalue is defined by something like this equals lambda phi. That is the eigenvalue problem, right? where j is the Jacobian of this function okay? and lambda is the eigenvalue and phi is the corresponding eigenvector. Okay? That is a vector, remember I showed you the MATLAB demonstration, the vector that leaves itself untransformed. If I multiply phi by j, I get the same vector phi except for some stretching. Okay? That's, it's a unique vector. Every other vector multiplied by j will give you a new vector, a different vector. But an eigenvector basically gives you the same vector. And for an n-dimensional system, there are n eigenvalues and n eigenvectors. Okay? So if I want to impose the condition that one exactly one eigenvalue is 0, I just say, okay, this is 0. So what, all I want is j times phi must be equal to 0. I impose that condition. Okay. Now, what is the problem by imposing that condition? I do not know what phi is. And how many equations do I have? I have n equations here and this is again n equations I need to satisfy. Okay, but I do not know what the eigenvector is. I know the eigenvalue must be 0, so I impose that condition. Okay. And I know what j is. I have calculated that. Okay. Uh, there is a possibility that if phi is 0, for example, I could satisfy that, right? j times phi is equal to 0, okay? Uh, so I do not have to impose the condition that j times phi is equal to 0, but phi is not 0, meaning it is not a trivial vector. It is a non-trivial eigenvector, okay? So that means I need to add an additional condition. Typically, it is indicated by L of phi equal to 1, okay? So that is some measure of norm of the vector must be equal to 1. We could simply have uh, all the components of phi, phi 1 square plus phi 2 square plus phi 3 square equal to 1. You can normalize it like that. So this condition ensures there is one equation there. It ensures that there is a non-trivial eigenvector with a zero eigenvalue. So these are in fact the exact conditions must be satisfied at a simple limit point. 
If I can solve that extended system of 2n plus 1 equations, I will be able to get the exact location of Qc. Now, what are the unknowns in this equation? Again, I'm going to use capital X for an extended set of vector and capital F for the extended set of equations. Now we have 2n plus 1 equations. Okay. And the unknowns are going to be also 2n plus 1. What are they? They are x and I said phi is an unknown vector, right? And then p. P is an unknown because I want to find that value of p where that condition is satisfied. So I am letting the system search the space of p where this condition would be satisfied that I have an eigenvalue 0 and an eigenvector as a non trivial one. And that is my new extended system of equations f as a function of x equal to 0. How do I solve that? Newton method. I can use all the power of Newton method, Euler Newton continuation, arc length continuation, etc. Okay, on this to solve, but the only problem is if I am dealing with two equations, it is fine. I end up having, I mean, if I have two original equations, an energy balance and a mass balance in a reactor problem, then to solve this system, I need to have five equations, 2 plus 2 plus 1. But if I have 200,000 equations, which is what might happen if I am solving Navier Stokes equation, the discretized version of Navier Stokes equation, then instead of 200,000 equations, we will have 401,000 equations. So, the Jacobian of this super matrix becomes enormously large. Okay. So, once again, I would use the Newton method. And that would be x of q plus 1 equals x of q minus Okay, and there are efficient ways of so inverting this matrix because this matrix now is huge for any realistic problem coming from partial differential equation. Okay. So, there are efficient ways of solving that and you will recognize that once we try to look at the structure of this Jacobian. How will the structure of the Jacobian look like? That is a good exercise for you to think about. So, I am going to partition this into three blocks. I want you to think about Remember, because why did I partition into three blocks? Because I have three sets of equations and three sets of unknowns. Okay, so this gives you thinking about block matrices and how do I construct this. So in the first block, I'm going to take the derivative of f with respect to the first set of variable x. On the same row, in the second block, I'm going to take the derivative of f with respect to phi okay and then the last one derivative of f with respect to p okay and then i go down to the next block the next block would be the derivative of this with respect to x and then this with respect to phi and that was with respect to q uh, sorry p okay so here i will have the original matrix j okay j remember is df dx okay here i will have d f with respect to d phi. What would that be? It would be 0 because there is no phi in that particular set of equation. Here I will have d f with respect to d p which I have already calculated before. right? And what will I have here? I need to call this as something else. Let me represent that equation as g. g equal to 0. Okay? So, here I will have d g with respect to g d x. Will that be 0? No, no, because this j will depend on x. When you are taking the derivative of j, it will depend on x. So, you are going to take the derivative of derivative, if you say, if you say okay. What will this be? It will just be j because that is a linear equation j times phi. So, when you take the derivative, this is going to be j, and this would be dg with respect to dp. Will that be 0? No, again, 
because this will contain p in it, right? Because that that comes from f. F contains p in it. Okay, so that won't be zero. And the last one, uh, l. I called it l. So we can just take the derivative. So it is dl with respect to dx. What about that? That will be zero, right? And here you'll have dl with respect to d phi. That won't be zero. It depends on what the norm condition that you put there is. You'll have to calculate that. And then dl with respect to d p will be zero. Okay. Now, if you recognize that there is some block structure, you can use Gaussian elimination idea on the blocks. Okay. But the problem would be if you do that and try to eliminate the entire block at a time by inverting the subblock matrices, then you will have to invert j at some time. But inverting j at that point is impossible. Why? j is singular. Its determinant is 0, right? So, you cannot use a simple block elimination process. You need to splice this out and there are some uh, what are called bordered algorithms that people have developed. So, that you still invert only an n by n matrix. Okay, once and then with vector mul matrix multiplications, we can get the solution to the complete uh, 2n plus 1 by 2n plus 1 equation. Okay, and that's you need to know those details only if you are really implementing it, but there are efficient ways of implementing it. Okay, so the basic idea, I guess, in this uh, series that I want you to look at is that there are powerful algorithms to track these kind of similarities and the basic idea of extending, finding what condition should be imposed. And impose that condition there. Okay. And uh, any questions for that? Yeah. Um, right now, P is just one parameter. Yeah. For a multi parameter system, yeah. you just extend that to a vector. Um, and then, I mean, you have <coughs> kind of Newton, Newton Euler within. Right, the right. So this idea can be kind of recycled many times, but you cannot. Um, Unless you have a higher order singularity, you cannot try to find two parameters at the same time by imposing. It is possible that two limit points come together wireless at a particular situation. I will show you some other possibilities. That is called a double limit point, and there you have to impose the two eigenvalues are going to zero, and there will be two parameters in the problem. So, um, a simple example suppose I think I have a figure like this, there are two limit points. And there is a second parameter in the problem. Okay, so this is parameter one, and I change the parameter, and I get uh, a solution that just comes like this. So this is for p one, this is for p two, and this is for p three, etc. Okay, so for a pair of values, specific values of p one and p two, you will have an inflection point where these two lim uh, limit points come together. That's a higher order singularity. So, you need to extend the system beyond. But the other thing that you can do if you have a second parameter is ask the question how does that limit point change when I change the second parameter? For that, all I need to do is solve this particular system with the second parameter P2. And I can continue, I can continue this ex extended system. So, at that point, I will have, I will be always on the fold and I will track how that fold changes when I change the second parameter. And when that fails, that curve fails to converge, that is an indication that you have a higher order singularity maybe. Okay? And there may be another fold that comes and merges at the same point. That will be a cusp, for example. Okay? That is a, that's a very good uh, way of thinking about how we can extend that. Okay? But the idea of euler newton continuation, arc length continuation can all be applied on this extended system with an additional parameter. Um, I was going to give you a few examples. Uh, maybe let me start with this example. This is a paper that came in the 90s when I was heavily involved in this area and I was really excited about this particular paper. Um, and I, I visited these guys in Germany. I was at in Germany at that time. The problem, they, they are in a nuclear research center. Okay? And uh, the problem they are looking at is uh, a closed loop. And there are a lot of interesting ideas in this paper. Okay. A closed loop of pipe, circular pipe that is built into a ring, but it is closed. 
there is no liquid that goes in or comes out. The idea is that these are used in nuclear reactors for example. Okay, so you have one section that is heated and then it is brought out. It's like a thermosiphon kind of a loop kind of a structure. And they idealized it. And uh, so one half of it is heated like TH. Okay, so this half of it is heated. And the upper half is cool. And the pipe diameter is small compared to the radius of the pipe. Okay. So you can assume, for example, that there is not significant variation in the cross section. So you can assume that they actually presented in a nice mathematical way that you could talk of area average. So average everything, the temperatures and the velocities over this cross-sectional area circle and you have only one value of temperature but the temperature does not depend on the radial position or on the angular position of the cross-section of the pipe but it depends only on this angle phi. Okay? And similarly you have a velocity that depends on phi. Okay? The question to you is if I do this experiment where this angle that is measured from here for example is zero so that I have this kind of move this way and that moved and it is in a horizontal location. The heating and cooling are heating is occurring exactly at the bottom and cooling is occurring exactly at the top. Okay. What kind of a behavior would you expect from your intuition physically? Think about that and then think about if I tilt it by see even one degree from that horizontal position, what kind of a behavior would you expect? Simple. The heated liquid, because it becomes lighter, would have a tendency to go up. But when it is perfectly horizontal, will it be able to go? And that introduces the idea of symmetry and symmetry breaking in this particular problem. Okay? So if I have it tilted, for example, in the, the way that it is in the picture, then I can very easily see. Okay, there is a hot fluid here and there is a cold fluid there. So the cold fluid wants to come down and the hot fluid wants to go up. So it's going to set up a circulation. The liquid will circulate continuously in that. So if I tilt it the other way, it could change the direction of the circulation. But if I keep it perfectly horizontal, what's going to happen? It will remain as a stable conduction state. The only way that the heat will be transferred is by conduction mechanism. There will be no, no convection until a certain heating rate. Okay, so if I heat at a higher rate, that, that means I am controlling TH and TC. Okay, so the delta T that I impose will tell me that up to a certain value, I will have only the conduction state and then it will bifurcate supercritically with the pitchfork bifurcation once I exceed certain delta t. Here I am plotting for example the velocity. So in this case the circulation is one direction, in the other case the circulation is in the other direction. Okay. The same figure, this is at the tilt, uh, I think they call it delta as the tilt angle, delta is zero. The same picture if I put delta as positive will just decompose like this. Okay, That is this gets connected to the top and this becomes disconnected and you get another point. And similarly, if I have delta equal to less than 0, it will connect to the bottom. So, it is exactly the same picture that we saw earlier, but the picture gets much more complicated very quickly and it is actually very similar to Lorentz equation. Okay. So, how do you analyze such a problem? So, is the physics clear what is happening? Okay. <coughs> so, Can you see this? Maybe not. Let me see whether I can blow this up. In the theory, basically, they say I'm going to use an area averaged equation. So they start with that point. But if you want to show that, maybe in the later part when you talk, talk about averaging, you can come and visit 
and see how do we get this equation from the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, that's a question. So you start with the Navier-Stokes equation because that is the one that governs the fluid mechanics and heat transfer of this particular problem. And what would really happen is if you have a pipe like this, and if you look at what happens, you are heating it. There will actually be convection currents that will be set up. There will be a gradient in temperature within the pipe, no matter how small the cross section is. But they have said, I'm going to use the area average temperature and area average velocity. So it's as if there is a slip, there is a plug flow. The velocity is not satisfying the slip condition. You can derive that by doing the volume averaging or the area averaging of the navier stokes equation. So what is this equation? Continuity equation. It simply says that there is no variation in the velocity in the phi direction. Phi is the direction along the angular portion of the loop, right? So the velocity is the same. If it starts moving, incompressibility will dictate that the velocity should be same everywhere in the pipe. It's a closed loop. Okay. So that is a continuity equation. What is this equation? It's the area averaged momentum equation. Okay. And in the momentum equation, what is this term? Is the buoyancy term, okay, the gravitational term or the buoyancy term. Okay. And this is the pressure term. And what would this term be? That's the term that we say is lost in the process of averaging. So remember, when you are doing the averaging of the navier stokes equation, you will have terms like mu times del square v dA along the cross section of the pipe. What is this? This is the viscous effect, right? So it's a friction. Okay? So they say, okay, I don't know because I am not resolving what the velocity field is. I cannot calculate that. So when you are doing the integration, you will come up with this term, which you cannot resolve until you solve it in detail. So we say, okay, I'm going to replace it by a friction term. Okay. So I'm going to use that model of a friction factor to calculate what is the friction term. And you do the same thing with heat transfer also. The and it take the energy equation and here you have the uh, accumulation term, the convective heat transfer is important. You include that. And what is this term? Conduction in the phi direction. Because they are averaging only in the cross section, you should have the convection in the phi direction also appearing in there. Okay? And this is the heat transfer from the fluid. This is the area average temperature in the fluid to the wall. So heat is transferred from the fluid to the wall. So this is the same interaction that the fluid is having with the wall for energetically, whereas this is the same interaction from momentum point of view, from friction point of view. So these are closure relationships. And you could also have a heat flux through the boundary, for example. Okay, so they are accounting for both cases, and that is your area average model. So conceptually, we can understand what each term physically means, but to derive that from the Navier-Stokes equation, they have not done that. But you can do that. You can take the Navier-Stokes equation, apply this area averaging operator, and define the temperature as area average temperature. Okay, yeah. In this model, why why do they have pro not? As, uh, I guess, Good question. <laughs> that, that's the Bosonesque approximation. They, I think they mentioned somewhere. Okay. Do you remember what Bosonesque approximation is? It doesn't say the viscosity or Except in place where it matters. Oh, okay, right, right. <laughs> okay. That's a key part. The Bosonesque approximation says density and viscosity are constant everywhere except in place where it matters most. Where does it matter most? Here. Right? If you say it is constant there, then there is no buoyancy force, there is no buoyancy force. Okay? So the, that approximation allows you to make that assumption that uh, rho is a constant. <coughs> now it is a partial differential equation because you have two variables, time and the spatial variation phi. Right? Um, even though it is a much simpler model than the navier stokes equation, how do you solve it? The way to solve this, they did using Galatkin method. How many of you know what a Galatkin method is? How many of you do not know? Okay. So you guys, uh, we need a course in <laughs> computational methods, I think. Um, the idea behind the Galatkin method is uh, you put 
it, it's like the finite element method. They all have very similar uh, idea that, that it's a nonlinear problem. There's no way I can solve this analytically. I need to do it numerically. Okay. Finite difference is one method that you can uh, use. In the Galapka method, what you do is you replace each t as a function of phi in terms of a series expansion. Okay, so you might have a n. Uh, what do they call it? I'm running out of symbols. Here. Chi of phi n. Some function, known function. Okay, and these are called the basis functions. Okay, the idea is. You can take any arbitrary vector and represent it as a linear combination of basis vectors. Okay, the basis vectors, if it spans a complete space, you have a complete representation. So, in the same way, you have basis functions. These are sines and cosines, for example. Okay, they are orthogonal functions, and if you take the Fourier series, okay, and then in fact that's what they did. But you can also take Bessel functions, Legendre functions. These are polynomials of various degrees, Chebyshev polynomials, which we used in some of the uh, methods and then it's called the spectral method. So the idea is, if you use um, Galactan method, you are going to have some sort of a basis function. And when you take this function, you are defining your solution in terms of this. This is an unknown, right? And this is a known function. And you're going to take 20 terms or 40 terms. You decide that. Okay, that is leads to your truncation error. But these coefficients become unknown. You need to find the best value of the coefficient. In such a way that this function satisfies that differential equation in uh, in some sense, okay, and that sense is form a residual. The residual uh, is basically the left hand side minus the right hand side, but the residual is going to be a function of a n, okay, left hand side minus right hand side equal to zero. I'm giving a very rough conceptual idea of what Galactic method does. Okay, so if I take this, I can clearly take this, and wherever I have t, I can plug that. When I plug that, because these are known functions, I can take its derivative. For example, here I need to take the second derivative of this. But I know this function, so I can take the derivative. So what I will end up after I uh, plug it into this, and I will have a residual that is an error between the left-hand side and right-hand side that need not be equal to 0, okay? uh, but it will depend on a n. So my task is to tune these values of a n in such a way that I make that residual as small as possible. And you can do that in a couple of ways. In collocation method, what you do is, okay, I have n such unknowns. I've chosen to pick, for example, n equal to 0 to capital N. So I have n unknowns. I'm going to pick n data points and make that residual equal to 0 at those points. That's my collocation method. In a Galerkan method, you say, I'm going to take this residual and find an integral of the error. Okay, so I'm going to take some weighting function, r, and that x itself d5 is equal to 0. So I'm taking the residual, multiplying it with the basis function, and integrating it over the domain in phi, and I'm setting that equal to 0. Okay. So I'm trying to minimize the error in an integral sense instead of doing it at specific points. The theory is much more uh, rigorous than what I just outlined. But this is the idea that they used, and they use basis functions as Fourier series. Okay. So here, phi is your independent variable, t is the time, and this is expressed in terms of t0 plus a series expansion in sines and cosines. So in here, Sn becomes an unknown, Cn becomes an unknown, okay? And they do, do the same thing for Q, and uh, they plug that in, and what you end up getting is a set of equations for Sn and Cn. Okay. In this case, I think Qn can be calculated because they know the heating rate. Okay. Because Q is given by this. Okay. So the Sn and Cn are the unknowns. The resultant will be an ordinary differential equation because the original problem was a partial differential equation, dynamic partial differential equation with time in it. Right. So we are treating these uh, coefficients as the functions of time. So what you will get is end of uh, in the end you will get a series of ordinary differential equations. How many equations will be there in the series? That depends on how many terms you take in that series. If you take infinite number of terms, you will get infinite number of differential equations. But the beauty in their work is, of course, they do non-dimensionalization, non um, 
and they put some closure models for H, the heat transfer coefficient and the friction factor. These are all have to be input. But when they do this analysis, x1, x2, x3 are the unknowns. And of course, you have x4, x5, x6, x7, all the way going to infinity. Okay? And these are the coefficients in this series expansion. And the first three seem to be completely uncoupled from the remaining equations. What does that mean? The dynamics is determined by the first three equations. If you look at the next set of equations, um, for n greater than 2, x two x dot 2 n, x dot 2 n plus 1, they are kind of paired. So, beyond that you need to solve two equations at a time. Okay, but they depend only on x1 and they are coupled within themselves like x2n depends on x2n plus 1, x2n plus 1 depends on x2n and on x1. Okay, so the structure of the equations is such that the first three equations are nonlinear and the remaining equations are actually linear. Why do I say it is linear? x1 is known by the time you come to solve for x4, x1 will already be known. Okay, and similarly x2 will be known and they are, I mean x1, x2, x3 will be known but these appear linearly in that. So, you can actually construct a series solution to any degree of accuracy that you want. Keep in my mind that you are using area averaged one. So, there is already some error introduced by that. Okay, but important point is to assume that uh, to recognize that the dynamics is governed by these three nonlinear equations and there are physical interpretations to that x1 represents the uh, flow rate and x2 and x3 represent the horizontal temperature difference and the vertical temperature difference, etc. And there are a number of parameters appearing here alpha, beta, k, the heat transfer coefficient, the axial conductivity, etc. Delta is the angle, angle of tilt. So, it is a very rich problem in terms of the parameter space that uh, you need to explore. But they make an interesting observation which I did not realize until very recently. For the case of symmetric heating, when delta is 0 and constant heat transfer coefficient, the constant heat transfer coefficient in this term means the k is 0. This is the constant part of the heat transfer model. Okay? So, the k is 0. This equation actually reduces to Lorentz equation. Lorentz in fact derived his three equations using Gallatin method, but his model was not a convection in a loop, it was a convection in the atmosphere. Right? It is governed by the same set of equations. The same mathematical method gives rise to the same set of three equations with a very rich structure of uh, the solution. How rich is the structure? This picture will, will blows my mind. <laughs> okay, that is the bifurcation diagram. What you are plotting is the velocity. Remember, x1 is a measure of the velocity. So, the velocity is positive means it is spinning clockwise, it is negative means it is spinning counterclockwise. And it is a case where delta is equal to 0. So, there is a symmetry in the problem and there is a conduction state up to a value of beta. Beta is the heating rate, the temperature difference. So, at this point you have a supercritical bifurcation and this becomes unstable. This solution becomes unstable. That means there is a convection, a stable convective mode beyond this critical value. Okay? And then it goes all the way up to here, remains stable and then it jumps, then all, all these are periodic states. Okay? So, here there is already a, a jump to a periodic state. There is a hop bifurcation by this particular problem. It is a 3 by 3 problem, so they could actually track where the hop bifurcations are. They have used all the tools that we have talked about, okay? continuation method and uh, the limit point, the hop bifurcation point, how to locate them. Now, the condition at the hop bifurcation point is what? <coughs> you must have a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues. There should be no real eigenvalue, right? You impose that condition instead of saying that one eigenvalue goes to zero. Then you construct an extended system, okay? And that extended system will have not 2n, but 3n, 3n plus 2 unknowns, okay? And n, of course, would be, why? Because now we are dealing the calculations in complex space. That is a problem, okay? So, eigenvector will be complex. So, there will be a real part of the eigenvector, there will be an imaginary part of the eigenvector. We can derive an extended system for that. And the extra two parameters, one will be the parameter that we are interested in finding where the off bifurcation point would be. The other one would be 
Can you can guess what that might be for a half bifurcation point? The actual value of the eigenvalues, the imaginary part of the eigenvalues, right? And what is the physical meaning for that? That's the oscillation. Okay, so it tells you what is the frequency of oscillation at the half bifurcation point. Okay, so um, they have used all these techniques to map out this one delta equals zero. It's a very interesting paper. Uh, it's a very extensive analysis as well. And then they have one for delta not equal to zero. Uh, one is for delta greater than zero. You can see the solution continuously evolves. That means the convection is there continuously. There is a tilt, there is a convection continuously. That's for positive delta and this is for negative delta, I think. I'm not sure what this is. No, they are both for positive. That's why, yeah, delta is one. In one case, it's five. In the other case, it's 15 degrees because they both go the same way. If you had a negative delta, then the curve should go connect to the bottom one. And then there is a hub bifurcation, and uh, from there we have additional hub bifurcations. Uh, and one route to chaotic flow is thought to be this kind of idea of a period doubling. Uh, every critical value you have the period of the oscillations doubling up. Okay, I think we'll stop there, and uh, in the next lecture maybe I'll go into few other examples and we will do linear stability analysis that's something that I want to do as well on the Taylor Quinn problem and we we'll look at the results that uh, people have obtained uh, using the same ideas uh, in the nonlinear world as you push away from the linear domain. Okay. Any questions? Oh, okay. Good. Good